All right, we are heading into closing arguments in the Alec Murdoch trial, and I wanted to outline for you my top five prosecution problems and top five defense deficits that I think the sides will have to overcome in order to prevail here. So let's start with the prosecution. Five problems with the case, the five biggest ones as I see it. Number one, there is a lack of physical evidence. Despite all the witnesses, 76 of them, and weeks of trial, we have no evidence of blood on Alec Murdoch of any meaningful amount. There's no DNA evidence. There's no fingerprint, footprint, or GSR evidence tying him to this crime. No matter what the prosecution does, they cannot put a gun in Alec Murdoch's hands, much less two guns, which were used in this murder, these murders. Problem number two, the investigation. I mean, this is problematic work by South Carolina law enforcement. The crime scene itself was a crime scene. They completely failed to take control of that, to keep people off of it, to keep the evidence from, I mean, people came and walked around, people cleaned up the house, people cleaned up the kennels. It was overrun, not preserved. There are questions about whether law enforcement followed every lead. It is shoddy work that could come back and bite the prosecution. Number three, the gruesomeness of the crime. Now this is an odd thing to put on the list of prosecution problems, but here I feel like the defense really leaned into how horrible these shootings were because they're saying no matter what you think about Alec Murdoch and everything else in his life, then even if you thought he might kill these people, how could a father shoot his son in the head like this? And so the gruesomeness of the crimes, I think, is more of an obstacle to the prosecution on its theory of the case. Number four, the testimony of Alec Murdoch. Now, it is a dangerous call to put the defendant on the stand in a case like this where you have lots of good reasonable doubt arguments, but that's what the defense did. And if even one juror looked Alec Murdoch in the eye, and remember, you know, they're six, ten feet away from him. They're in the room with him. If even one juror looked him in the eye and believes him, that can be an insurmountable problem for the prosecution. There will not be a conviction if any juror believes Alec Murdoch. And while the cross-examination had some moments, it was far from the sort of knockout the prosecution was looking for. Alec Murdoch's testimony is a problem. But the fifth and biggest problem for the prosecution is the prosecution's burden. And that's true in every criminal case, but it's very true here. Remember, the prosecution doesn't just have to have the better expert witnesses, the more credible version of what happened that night. They can't just probably be right. They have a burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and they have a burden of convincing every one of the 12 jurors to convict. So they have to get every one of the 12 jurors to believe that they have proved beyond a reasonable doubt the guilt of Alec Murdoch. That is a very tough hill to climb, and I'm not sure they got there in this case. That being said, let's talk for a couple minutes about the defense's deficits. Number one, all of the lying. So much lying. Forget about the crimes, which the jury might forgive other crimes, even though I think they were particularly heinous given the victims of Alec Murdoch. But he established in this trial that for at least 10 years he has been lying to everyone, his family, his friends, his clients. And it's hard to imagine that that stopped the minute he entered the witness stand. And so can the jury get over that and believe anything he had to say? Number two, more specifically, Alex Murdoch's lying about the night of the murders. 
this is the part of the case that would, might really get him. If it wasn't for the video that has his voice establishing he was at the kennel the night minutes before the murders, there might not be much of a case against him. But we know he was there. He's now admitted he was there, and he's admitted he lied to law enforcement about that. Why would an innocent man not want to give law enforcement every factual detail he knows about the murder and the time surrounding the murder of his wife and son? That is a problem. Also, he lied about his time after the murders. Remember, he had this whole story. We thought it might be the centerpiece of his defense, this alibi that he went to his mother's. But when you break down that trip, He's driving 80 miles an hour back and forth, frantically calling everybody he can think of, spends only 20 minutes with his mother, despite having told law enforcement it was more like 45. This looks less like an alibi and more like a frantic effort to establish cover. If this was a movie, I would call it the fast and the spurious. But the lying about where he was both before and after the murders is a big problem for Alec Murdoch. Number three, the defense doesn't have to give a credible alternate theory of what happens, but the jury will want to think about if it wasn't Alec Murdoch, who was it? And on this point, the defense really hasn't had anything credible to say. Alec Murdoch testified that he thinks it was people from social media, whatever that means, some sort of Instagram assassins who came out of social media onto the property, knew just where to go, n waited for him to leave, murdered his wife and son, and then got off of the property. It's a problem. There's no other credible theory as to who did these killings. Number four, Alex Murdoch's testimony. I told you it was a problem for the prosecution. It's also a problem for the defense. Again, this was a risky move and it might have backfired in this respect. I mean, he had to admit to all of these lies and all of these crimes. He had to admit to lying about to SLED and his story about that, that the reason he lied to SLED was because he was paranoid because of his years of drug use it doesn't hold up. I mean, first of all, there was a very effective questioning at the end of that cross-examination, which was too long and ineffective in other ways. But right at the end, there were some very effective questions that Alec Murdoch didn't wait for SLED. He told this lie about having left the uh, property earlier to other law enforcement. So there's that problem. But also his selective paranoia. I mean, this is ridiculous. The idea, he was pushed on this in cross-examination and essentially said, well, well, paranoid, but it's only the lying kind of paranoid. It's not the murdering kind of paranoid. I really think he's trying to have that both ways. And I can see the jury having a big problem with his credibility. It's a problem if one of the jurors believes him, but also his testimony might have convinced the jurors not to believe him. Lastly, the biggest problem for the defense is the timeline. The timeline is very effectively presented by the prosecution in this case, and it shows it would have been really amazing for Alec Murdoch to leave the kennels, go back to his house, leave for his mother's, and in that very tight window, someone else came on the property, did these murders, also left the property, and didn't encounter Alec Murdoch on the way at all. The timeline is so tight. He was there at the kennels minutes before these murders were likely done. It's very hard to put anybody else in there. It goes back to not having another alternate theory of what happened, but the timeline is the biggest problem. So there you have it. Those are what I think are the biggest problems for the prosecution and the defense. What do I think the outcome will be? I don't know. I think, I think an, uh, a guilty or an innocent finding could both be rational conclusions 
based on the evidence presented in this case. I think either outcome is possible. It is up to the 12 jurors that we have entrusted and given the great burden of sitting through this trial and hearing all of the evidence and looking at some of this very difficult evidence and making a decision. We will see what they say. As always, the jury has the final word. Take care, everybody.